Here we go. All right, so thank you everyone to coming virtually to this presentation on gambling in the 19th century. Please feel free to put questions up. Oh, sorry. Um, please feel free to put any questions in the Q&A section. I will try to make sure that I leave time to go through those at the end. I'll also be heading into the break route, uh, sorry, breakout room in the Discord, which is Pride of Baltimore 2 at the end of this. So if I don't get to your questions here, I can get to it there. All right, so let's get this ball rolling. So per the description in the program, the saloons of the American West, the, the clubs of upper class European society, the riverbanks of the Mississippi, the tracks of Saratoga and Ascot, the casinos of the Riviera and Macau, all played host to one of humanity's oldest obsessions, gambling. And I definitely viewed this as more of a way to not just focus on the Old West, which is what a lot of people think of when they first see, um, hear mention of gambling in the 1800s, but gambling, of course, was worldwide at this point. Um, However, I was not able to find information about gambling from every single continent, which was part of my initial goal. Gambling was definitely an open secret, but it, when you no longer have a central place that's recognized to gather in the information about what was going on, becomes a little murkier. You can only point to, well, we know they gambled, but I wasn't necessarily able to come up with information. Um, for what I could find, um, there is a number of different places within the United States that was um, that were centers of gambling, as well as the United Kingdom, Europe, Surprisingly, there are other places in Europe to gamble than in Monaco and the French Riviera, and there were a number of places known for gambling in Asia as well. We, for a caveat with the United Kingdom, that includes the United Kingdom being the glorious empire it was by the end of the 1800s did drive a lot of the policy about what was legal and not legal in their first their colonies and then the place where places where they did protectorships and provinces and such even as they those then gained independence um they were still very involved in setting precedent for what happened in those countries. So for North America, I found evidence of uh, gambling definitely for the United States, uh, some information about Canada and Mexico. It's a, I suspect there's a lot more information for Mexico and also South America that no hablo espanol. I I took Russian in high school. I did not take Spanish. So that was definitely a barrier to finding more information. Of course, the city that never sleeps didn't sleep back then. On um, while some gambling was legalized throughout the state, New York City actually for the most of the 1800s, all gambling was illegal. So everything was either street gambling, uh, the, the uh, numbers racket started at this time, 
or it was in some high society context that the police either couldn't touch or they were already knee deep in it themselves so they wouldn't touch even with it being illegal they there was at least 6000 gambling halls by the mid 19 sorry mid 1850s and when it comes to that high society there were two kind of major camps catering to the highest of the high society in new york city the first one was a set of excuse me, a set of casinos, um, one in particular called the Saratoga Club, run by a Mr. Canfield, his name will come up again in a moment. And the other was a syndicate that was sponsored by Tammany Hall, which was a political social organization that had a lot of influence and a lot of corruption and these the syndicate ran a gambling ha um, house called the bronze door and the picture i have shown here the bronze door was actually located about two to three doors to the left of this intersection now when the rich in New York City wanted to get away, particularly in the summertime for the heat, they ended up going to a number of different places, but one of the most popular places was Saratoga, New York, which for one has a set of natural mineral spas, so it was very early on de developed into a European English style spa resort kind of like bath in england so that people could take the waters and since it was already bringing the rich to it for that the first um there was some early attempts at gambling halls and such but they weren't really all that successful until one of those casino owners by the name of John Morrissey decided to build a racetrack. Um, there had been some harness racing, but he, so he ran one flat track racing meet there and then bought some land across from the harness racing track and built what is now the Saratoga Raceway. And it is currently the oldest, not only the oldest flat track in the United States, it's still it's still been running the entire time. I'd have to check to see if World War II interrupted anything, but it the Traverse Stakes still happens every August in as the their birthday celebration, and you never want to be around Saratoga in August. I lived in that upstate area traffic's a nightmare so that thing john morrissey with the success of the racetrack then built a again highly illegal european style small casino that i've been to this location it's not all that big um in comparison but it he built it and then a few years later he stepped down it changed hands to one mr um canfield and it's now known as the canfield casino also if you've ever played uh canfield style solitaire it's named after the same gentleman other pre a lot of the other gambling in the united states um there was a lot of horse racing related gambling Ac across the United States, particularly in major transit hubs like um, Chicago and Cleveland and 
this will continue into the American frontier and also the Canadian frontier, where as new places were established, gambling kind of crept in pretty early. Now, often in an area that was conducive to horse racing and had a reputation for it, even when other forms of gambling was illegal, bidding on horse racing was still allowed. Now, so um, for Cleveland, you actually get more harness racing than in other parts of the country. And in Chicago, the gamblers, both for horse racing and also other types of gambling and card games and such, the kind of genesis of what later turned into the Chicago mob actually starts by the 1870s where they start pooling their resources and be and their influence to be able to take on greater risks. So another image of American gambling in the 1800s is the riverboats. Now, part of how this happened is that the river the rivers were often state borders between the states. So theoretically, or at least what a lot of the riverboat captains argued is like, well, if we're in the middle of the river, either we're in this state where gambling is legal right now, or if a state that they set a state they were going through both made gambling illegal well we're in the river we're not on your land so that doesn't count we can gamble so that gray area allowed arguably allowed them to provide gambling access when a place places along the river could not legally offer it and this continued even after the riverboats weren't transporting so much freight, but just people. Now, Louisiana has always had a different feel to it than the rest of the United States. So when Louisiana gained statehood in 1803, New Orleans in particular, had more gambling halls than New York City, Boston, and Baltimore, Maryland combined. And this gave enough revenue to the state that back and forth, whenever either the federal government or the state government banned some sort of um, gambling, it was still legal in New Orleans. Now, as I mentioned before, with the um, the Wild West, gambling was established very early on, as soon as you got past the states and into the territories. In fact, like one of the first buildings or tents to go up, along with your church, your sheriff, and like your grocery store and your like your general store and your bank, there'd be a gambling hall with or without a saloon. And because physical gambling halls, particularly in a location where it was legal, liked to be impressive, they were also what some of the best maintained buildings in any given town. And they also always just looked more refined and fancy and had better furniture and um, better decoration. Gamblers, gambling and gamblers was more respected in the Wild West because it was a way for a person to 
make their way. And in particular, if they were good at it, they could make their way without having to engage in more physical work. So while in other parts of not just the country, but the world, you had to be respectable in spite any gambling you do, gamblers in the Wild West were respected because they were had the smarts and the personality to be able to make a living out of it. Now, in the earliest days of gambling, per, um, basically, before you had an established casino and the casino was providing the investment money for to bet against particularly in the west it was the individuals who provided their own equipment and money for the stake so basically like doc holiday was pretty famous as a gambler and a and a good shot that he would go he had his own faro table set up and he they these gamblers would rent a table or two or three in a saloon or a gambling hall and their money was what was on the line not the bank not the not the saloons not the gambling halls it was their personal money which also went into that respect because they were putting themselves on the line. Um, major gambling in the West, in terms of like well-known places to gamble, we've got San Francisco because of the gold rush and the influx of immigrants from China and other parts of Asia brought in a new set of games that the Americans weren't as familiar with. Likewise, these same people um, went to the mining towns and cattle towns. So this is where you get Deadwood, Tombstone being well known for their gambling for better or for worse. And um, all sorts of games were played in the, in, in, um, both kind of European American and Asian, but that image of poker as the game that Cowboys played when they went to the saloon is actually fairly false. Poker was played, but it wasn't as ubiquitous as Hollywood from the 1950s would lead you to believe. Pharaoh, which I'll explain a little bit later was the king of games and basically any self-respecting gambling hall would have someone running a faro table at any given time <coughs> one moment So now on to other parts of North America. Um, gambling in Mexico was one of, that was one of the few places that did not make gambling illegal until basically the end of the century. They didn't go back and forth like a lot of other areas did um, until the Mexican Revolution. Um, Actually, in general, the Spanish seem to be much more at ease with gambling than some of the rest of their European brethren. Um, but even when Spain itself was kind of going along with the rest of the Europe, their colonies or their, or their offshoots kept gambling going. As I mentioned earlier, since 
Canada, well, since the United Kingdom, this big, huge, globe-spanning empire was controlled from this little tiny island called England, England had actually made gambling, like major, most forms of gambling illegal starting in the 12th century. And Canada was subject to the same laws until it gained independence. At first, each province had their own set of laws and until 1892 when they just went the Canadian government as opposed to the English government and nope, not gonna do it. Um, I mentioned the Klondike gold rush in the list because while your provinces in Canada went kind of back and forth, like the American West, the territories in Canada, A, had their own gold rush, and with that, the same sort of influx of people and immigrants coming in to work on mines and such, and they had a very similar outlook in their, in the Canadian West as the American West in regards to gambling. So now on to England. There, this is not definitely this is definitely not a all-inclusive list of where people were gambling in England. Um, I was seeing so I did see some evidence for gambling in like Birmingham and Edinburgh. Um, I saw mention of Cardiff, but in Wales, but I wasn't able to like pin down anything specific enough to refer to which there's a there was a lot of oh they did it and then didn't mention where or any specific cases where it was discovered again it was legal it was sorry again in most of england any type of gambling was illegal um horse racing be was so at time, one of the few approved or at least semi-approved forms of gambling, and um, you could have betting houses that were known about, but at one point, yes, they even tried to close those, and that went into the streets. Now, the upper class always had a level of exemption from those laws because they could afford to have a private club or to have a lavish salon room in or billiards room or whatever in their houses that were limited access so while gambling was known to happen in these clubs and in these fancy homes nothing was ever really done about it you could ruin your reputation by racking up gambling debts and not being able to pay off your debts but unless you did yourself in so bad that you went to debtor's prison there was no other real legal consequence of gambling now this is the industrial revolution in both in well around the world and with the changes of technology in particular the um telegraph and the then later the telephone information was could be shared faster and therefore the at, within a very short time span the demand for Horses to race doubled in the in the um, in the mid 1800s. Liverpool was one of the major racing centers. Um, London didn't really have the room to actually host the races at, but Liverpool did. 
so um the host of the grand national is aintree which is in liverpool itself and it's been open since 1839 and then the chester race course which is nearby actually and was still running in the 1800s and i believe to this day as well was started races in the 16th 16th century a little before this time now one of the places that a lot of these horses did end up coming from was Ireland. Ireland has had a long horse breeding tradition and also in some areas enough land to actually do the racing on. So um, Before the 1800s, they started, so when 1800 came along, they started with 400 places that you could bet on horses. And again, as that technology increase happened, it just kept going up by the end of the century. Um, I mentioned before that there were, in America, the two major styles of racing were harness track and flat track. In Ireland and in England, a lot, was a lot of the racing was steeplechase or otherwise known as um jump racing or hunt racing because it was the type of racing that was established to emulate like hunting in the woods on a horse and there's obstacles to go over and such um this picture is of the i'm going to see punchton but a i don't know gaelic that well so i may be very well off um this is um it, later part of the, the century um it's one of the major tracks in ireland and basically the tracks that had perhaps been like just open fields or actually steeplechase means from steeple to steeple so it was a race that kind of took place between um between churches um these got renovated and updated the steeplechases instead of being along the roads from one church to another turned into a like a preset course with obs man-made obstacles and and man uh, that could be taken up and put down and moved as opposed to landscape obstacles so they these places either reformatted or just otherwise updated to include things like stands and um viewing stands and food and sanitation um, facilities now on to europe at the time and now monaco which is a principality for, in france is and the rest of the french riviera is the height of gambling but i found that a lot of high society gambling also took place in germany so france outlawed gambling in the 1830s but monaco was was exempt from the ban so there was a bit of a rush in Monaco to try to build gambling facilities to take in the flux of people that wanted to gamble from France that could no longer legally do so. And the development of Mon the actual Monte Carlo casino um, was started by the Princess Caroline and she suggested it. She 
when we can get a lot of revenue from this by taxation, et cetera, et cetera. And it took longer than they planned, but the casino and the resort that it was incorporated into opened in 1863 and was named after her son who became the Prince of Monaco. And from the very beginning, it like jumped to being the best casino in the entire world. Um, and this is actually an early Edwardian um, dr uh, drawing of the Monte Carlo, but it's it pretty much would look would have looked more or less the same when it first opened. So when France outlawed their gambling, yes, the Principality of Monaco was exempt. But there's a lot more to France than just the part by the Riviera. So a number of casinos had already been built in Germany, particularly in their spa towns. Um, and a number of these spa towns had had small casinos, but they experienced a distinct surge in popularity when the French were like, oh, wait, we can't do that here. Where are we going to go next? Um, so two of the most well-known at the time uh, was this my husband's going to cringe at my German pronunciation. I am sorry. And also anyone else who speaks German. Um, the Spielbank Weisbaden, where in it was opened before the 1800s, but again, renovated, made itself bigger to accommodate the, the French coming over. Um, but also a particular Russian, uh, Dostoevsky, supposedly, like, basically lost his shirt at Weisbaden in 1685, and as a result, he had to write a new book in order to get money to live on, and he actually used his experiences in gambling, particularly in, he, he had visited a lot of the German casinos to base the gambler on. Um, one of the other most popular ones was the Kurhaus and Spiel. So Kurhaus is the word for like cure. So actually almost what it sounds like in English, cure house or spa house. Um, the Kurhaus of Baden-Baden was built in 1823, and the Spielbank of Baden-Baden, which was Spielbank being the word for casino, was another highly popular one. The casinos were closed at the end of, towards the end of the century. A lot of the closures of casinos in particular and gambling in general were efforts spearheaded by social reformers, the same types of performer, sorry, reformers, not performers, reformers that would bring about um, prohibition or a stigma against drinking in the 19th century. Um, a lot, a number of them started off as being anti-gambling and fighting the evils of people losing all their money to gambling addictions. Now, Asia. Um, so Macau is for a long time been considered the Monte Carlo of the Orient, but that's kind of misleading because in at least the 1800s, most of the evidence I could find pointed to gambling being, yes, very prevalent in Macau, but much more smaller in scale for individual 
gambling establishments. Um, there were gambling, small gambling houses, but also just gambling carts that were licensed by the government. And then it wasn't until like the 19-teens, 1920s, that some of the businessmen in Macau decide, uh, like went, okay, we could actually just make this bigger and emulate the Europeans and not only get people from around us coming to visit, we can turn it into a tourist industry. Singapore was also kind of fairly similar in that, where a lot of it was small operations. They had this term called gambling farms because there were a lot of one of the favored uh, things to bet on at the time was uh, cockfighting. So the farms would not only where the cockfighting happened, but it had they had uh, basically a small chicken farm associated with it to take care of the chickens in between fights. Um, Singapore is also um, the location of the Singapore Turf Turf Club, which is the was the only authorized horse racing facility um both in ho holding races and accepting bets and that's true to this day um and a lot of the games played in both macau and singapore were asian games as opposed to european games at least throughout most of the century um most popular being Mahjong, Fan Tan, and uh, Pai Gao, which I'll explain a little bit later. Um, the Philippines and Japan also had some reputation for gambling. In particular, cockfighting in the Philippines was the biggest thing. Almost every single village had its own pit and its own rules. And the, yes, they also did European games because that was brought to them by the Spanish during their colonial era. And that lasted the longest time. But then when the Americans came in, in 1898, they tried to ban it. They legally banned it, but nothing changed. Japan's restrictions on gambling go back even further. Uh, they restricted gambling in the 8th and 12th centuries because uh, in particular, particular games got so popular that they developed a class of basically itinerant independent gamblers that then like traveled and formed families and became known as the Bakuto. And between the fact that they liked to travel around and they were gambling and other criminal activities that get associated with gambling and fighting and this and that, uh, in the 12th century, a like absolute ban on gambling was established. And it was also considered not to be in alignment with various philosophical and spiritual beliefs. Now, um, that did, there were some people like, like in Europe where if you were rich, you got some leniency. Um, in Japan, if you were a warrior, you got some leniency because, like, particularly a great, well-renowned samurai, oh, if he needs to let off a little steam, go, go 
they were allowed, well, they were overlooked when it came to things like gambling, drinking, and prostitution to the, where, to the point where those became known as the three pleasures of like not only well like three pleasures in life and both samurai and actors became associated with those uh as a result most of the gaming was in red light districts and while some european style games were introduced by the portuguese when the shogunate closed the access to japan off there was a oh let's get rid of everything european but carts were popular enough of an idea that they then got japanized with uh with different forms one of the most direct comparison being the hanafuda the meiji era when they reopened particularly when they reopened the borders not only got a lot of other western things brought back western gambling and i have a number of different games listed here all right that so i'm going to kind of quickly over go over a number of the so we went first started off with the places and some of what was done in those places now i'm just talking about the games themselves so we have dice game card games dice games roulette which i'm not considering a gambling machine because gambling machines are a bit more automated and the roulette the well, I'll, I'll explain later. Lotteries and a couple of does not fit into any category games. Um, so for card games, baccarat, blackjack, poker. If you've gotten any any, in the, um, if you've had any exposure to gambling, you've already come across those. Um, baccarat was also it has a Chinese, well, Pai Gao was, is a much older game, but has very similar principles, just hitting 13 instead of nine. Um, Blackjack was, came kind of from the French, and poker, again, was played, but um, not as much as Pharaoh. For dice games, um, craps was particularly popular because with street craps, you just like you could almost like draw out the betting board and as long uh, betting table, and as long as someone had a pair of dice, you were set to go. Um, and basically, the idea is to roll until you hit a point. In the meantime, each role has its own bet, um, and certain roles are very bad. Uh, Chuck a luck or no, or crown and anchor were basically the same game. The betting structure is a little different, but the major difference is the dice. Chuck a luck was played with regular numbered six sided dice and spun in a cage so that everyone could see what was going on and it's actually in some areas to this day popular as like a little carnival fundraiser sort of thing whereas crown and anchor was very popular um particularly among the navy go figure there's an anchor and is still uh, a favorite of the royal navy to this day um one of the main things with roulette is that it's a free spinning wheel and unless it's rigged in some way um there's no other mechanics really involved um some of the innovations for the 
roulette wheel that we know today were developed in the 1800, in particular, having um, the zero and double zero uh, were introduced and adding green to differentiate those spaces uh, was also introduced in the 1800s. Okay. Betting, gambling machines. So gambling machines, I'm, I'm considering more complicated mechanisms. The precursor to what we now think of as a slot machine was developed in 1891 and was basically um, like five discs with cards and the discs would randomly flip through. Um, they actually, and you got, well, there was no automatic payout. So you, these would be like next to the bar and you'd get whatever, like if you got a pair, maybe you got a beer and you'd go to the, you'd go to the bartender to pay out. Now, um, they, of course, the better the hand, the better the prize. So they actually took out two cards in order to lessen, decrease the chances of certain combinations and particularly decrease royal flushes. Um, between 1887 and 1895, um, what we now think of as like the kind of traditional three wheel slot machine with the symbols and automatic payouts was developed by Charles August Fay. And then right after that, um, because playing for money was still frowned upon and sometimes it was like you could get away with it if you were getting, say, a drink or cigars or a bottle of whiskey if drinking was legal. Um, Um, there was a smaller way of doing this, and I've got an image of one of those machines, basically, where, oh, it's food, it's not gambling. So you would put in a coin for a gumball, and, well, you might get, you, you, it's, it would do the slot machine thing, and, hey, maybe you'd get more gumballs. And sometimes the governments were, like, like particularly city governments, sometimes it went to like the state level where like you ain't fooling anyone. Um, so lotteries. Lotteries have been around since um potentially 2000 BC in China. And um there's two basic styles. There's the raffle style where the number is written on a ticket and a kino style which is the you select the numbers and actually bingo is a so bingo is kind of like a development of that but instead of trying to get just specific, how many numbers you have to get them in a specific location lotteries in general ten, uh, with the exception of bingo lotteries in general tend to be sponsored by big organization um and governments but it wasn't always legal um and then sports betting a lot of it was about horses and it went on to other things and um unfortunately i have hit the end of my time so <laughs> i knew this would be a risk of this particular uh presentation so if you want to follow me into the Discord channel for Pride of Baltimore 2. I can ask, answer any questions or get, give more information. Oh, it, it's up to you guys. I'll be there. I think we're there for like a half hour or so. Thank you very much and have a good night.